Hi everyone, my name is Alex and I'm here today to tell you about our search for the first stars. Before I begin though, can someone tell me what this is a painting of? Jupiter. Jupiter. Yes. Uh, so I actually, so what I learned today uh, from a previous talk is that you can't believe everything you learn on the internet. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I Googled and I was searching for the Greek Titans and they gave me this image and I said, oh, this looks great, let's use this. Uh, but yes, this is Jupiter who actually overthrew the Titans in Greek mythology to um, you know, come up to the world. But the reason I wanted this to be the Titans is because um, the, in, in Greek mythology, the Titans were the first gods. And when they um, were there, they actually started like the creation of everything in the universe. Um, but then they were overthrown by these Olympians over here. And so that means they're sort of you know, not around today. And the reason I tell this story is because the story of the first stars is actually essentially the same as the story of the Titans. The first stars were the first objects to form in the universe. While they were around, they were sort of the most important and most powerful things around. And they fundamentally changed the universe ever after. But they also all died in the early universe, and so we have to keep searching for them now. So what I'd like to tell you about today is why we know there must be first stars, what we think they were like, and what we're doing right now to search for them. Our story begins with Walter Bada, who, as Cindy just told you, actually identified two types of stars in galaxies. And uh, to tell you a little bit more about them, most of the stars that people knew about at the time were these type one stars. They were 99% of the stars, and it turned out that most of them sort of went in orbit similar to the sun in circles around the Milky Way disk. Then there were type two stars, which sort of had random orbits. Instead of sort of going in a frisbee, they went out in random motions inside of a ball. And the question that they had at the time was, why are there these two types of stars? Over the next two decades, this picture emerged that was actually largely developed here in Pasadena. The type one stars, it turns out, tended to be younger than the type two stars. And furthermore, their elemental composition was very similar to that of the sun. So this is a pie chart showing what our sun is made out of. The blue is hydrogen at 74%. It's about 24% helium. And everything else is only 2%, this little green sliver over here. So everything else includes things like the carbon, carbon in our bodies, the nitrogen and oxygen that we're breathing right now, the sodium that you're not supposed to be eating, um, the silicon inside of your cell phones, the iron inside of your blood, all of those elements just make up 2% of the sun. But these type 2 stars were even more extreme. They only This green sliver over here, that's 2%. It's actually 0.2 or 0.02% in the type 2 stars. And what well, astronomers realized was actually the type two stars are actually the ancestors of the type one stars. They come first. And so you would think that as astronomers, we should rename this type one because it comes first and that type two. But we don't rename things in astronomy. We keep everything the same forever. Um, so just to explain how this comes to be, imagine that you have the very early universe and you're making some type two stars. And there's not that many heavy elements in the universe at that time. Now, when you make stars, you make uh, stars that are sort of small and low mass, and these live for a very long time, tens of billion years or more. But you also make large, massive stars, and these large, massive stars live only a very short amount of time, uh, something like 10 million years, which is instantaneous in astronomy. Uh, <laughs> um, but these, they, they live very short amounts of time, and during their lives, they synthesize hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon, carbon into oxygen, and so on and so forth, up to iron and beyond. And when they die, they explode as supernova, releasing all of these heavy elements out into the universe. And so there's multiple generations of stars. These elements go out, mix, and form a second generation of stars, another generation of stars, and these are the type 1 stars. So you can see why these stars would have few heavy elements and be older, and these stars would have more heavy elements and be younger. Now, if you've got a curious mind, you might wonder, well, where did these heavy elements, the type 2 stars, come from? Well, those heavy elements must have been synthesized in stars the generation before that. And then if those had heavy elements inside of them, those must have been synthesized in a generation before that. And you can keep going back and back and back all the way to the beginning of the universe until you imagine a situation where there's no heavy elements at all. There's only hydrogen and helium. And so we start at the beginning of the universe with 0% heavy elements, and we keep going on and on and on until we get some heavy elements that are non-zero at the end. And this closely tracks the history of our universe. So the, our universe is not the same composition. It is ever evolving over time and ever growing in these heavy elements. 
the other really cool thing about this is that all of these stars over here are actually preserving a history of all of their ancestors. It's sort of like our DNA. So we have these chemicals that are released out over here, and then the next generation of chemicals that's released out over here, all of these get composed up into what our sun and other stars like it have today. This entire picture also fits into our understanding of cosmology. So we have the Big Bang at the beginning of the universe. And indeed, in the Big Bang, it predicts that essentially you should only have hydrogen and helium made. And all of those heavier elements only start to be made once you have the first stars and the first supernovae. And then the next generations of stars start to coalesce into galaxies. Our sun eventually forms inside the Milky Way galaxy. And around all of these stars and all of these galaxies, you get planets and then eventually life like you and me. What's really awesome about this whole picture is that because we have such a good idea of what's going on, we can actually take the composition at the beginning of the universe, put it on a really big computer, and run the laws of physics and see what predictions we might get for what the first stars look like. And so that's what I'm going to show you over here. So this is the video of the life and death of a first star. So the first star is this point of light over here. This first star is really massive. It's emitting a whole bunch of high energy radiation and blowing a bubble in the material around it. The star evolves and evolves, and eventually it's actually going to die. And very shortly, you'll see this big flash of light about now. And so that was the supernova of the star. And all of the heavy elements that it had synthesized in the middle over there now get spewed out into all of this material around here. What's really sad is that simulations like this have actually shown that all the first stars are massive. And as I told you before, massive stars have really short lifetimes. That means that all the first stars are dead. That means that if you're going out into the Milky Way galaxy and looking for a first star, you're, you're going to be out of luck. Uh, none of these survive until today. But as you saw, they released those heavy elements out into the universe. And so the ashes of the first stars actually live on in other stars and also in you and me today. As a matter of fact, I calculated just last night that each one of us has about a teaspoon of first star material inside of us. So you're fundamentally connected to these things. OK, so how do we actually go searching for the first stars? The standard trick we do in astronomy is if we look really far away, that's the same thing as looking back in time. And so since the beginning of time, but more recently, we've been able to get really, really far back in the history of our universe. And what's really exciting is there's this space telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope that NASA is launching. And over here, it says future. So this graphic was made, I think, in the 2010, early 2010s. But the future is actually almost here. So the James Webb Space Telescope is uh, expected to launch in spring 2019. And it should be able to see all the way back to 200 million years after the Big Bang. But if you remember on the previous slide in the bottom, it sort of said, first stars, 100 million years. So actually, the James Webb Space Telescope is not going to be able to look directly and see the first stars. So there's another way that we use to try and study what the first stars are like. And this is called stellar archaeology. The idea is that we look for second generation stars. So if we have these stars, they explode, spewing out all of those heavy elements. We can make a second generation of stars. And some of these can be low mass. So the lowest mass of these can survive over the history of the universe, 13.8 billion years, and end up in our Milky Way galaxy today. That means we can use a telescope, like the Magellan telescopes, to search for these second generation stars, which we then use to learn about what sort of supernova the first stars exploded as. The way we find these second generation stars is we look for stars that have almost no heavy elements, instead of 0.2% or 0.02%. These are stars with 0.00002% <laughs> of heavy elements. And so uh, that's what we try and do. We look for stars with almost no heavy elements. So on this over here is uh, one of these stars is a second generation star. Can any of you tell me which one it is? Any guess? The brightest one. The brightest one. That's a really good guess, but it's not right. <laughs> Whichever one's the smallest. That's also a good guess, but that one's not right. So it turns out to be this one right in the middle. I basically just put it right in the middle. But as you can see, you have no idea what it is. And that's because just by taking pictures of it, we can't tell what it is. 
But what we do instead is we take the light from the star and we split it up into its spectrum, into all of its different colors. And that's how we actually infer the compositions of these stars and search for the second generation stars. So um, just to show you the sort of data that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, when you take a spectrum of a star, it has all of these dark bands inside of it. Those dark bands correspond to dips like this. And if you're looking at a star like our sun that has lots of uh, heavy elements inside of it, you will see lots and lots of dips all, all throughout the entire, all of the different colors are absorbed. But if these two stars over here are two of the second generation stars that we know about, they have much fewer of these dips over here that are corresponding to the different elements. Indeed, they have just a little bit of iron, a little bit of nickel. And so those are two of the six second generation stars we know about. So this search is still ongoing. We keep looking out there to find stars with almost no heavy elements inside of them. But one of the things we've learned so far is it seems like the first stars made a lot of carbon and oxygen, but not a lot of iron. And we actually don't know why that is. We're still trying to figure out. With only six stars, it's hard to say for sure what's going on. But we're going to keep looking for them and keep going to try and understand what's going on. And that is our search for the first stars. Um, so with that, I'll leave a video here in the background. And then Cindy and I will take questions. Exactly, yeah. So um, we do search in red dwarfs to see if they are old stars. And red dwarfs can live a long time, but that doesn't mean that they are old, if that makes sense. So they can live Did for 30. Did you find any uh, that had very little? Yes, I think there is exactly one that I know of. The problem with red dwarfs is they're not that bright, so you can't see that far of them. And these are really rare, like 0.0001, I forget percent or not, <laughs> of the number of stars you find will be like this. Ah, that's, a, that's exactly it. <laughs> so um, there's populations that we have, the type 1 and type 2. Sometimes they call them population 1 and population 2. And the first stars we call population 3. Um, basically, instead of having a lot of heavy elements, very little heavy elements, population 3 is no heavy elements. So that would be a true surviving first star. Um, so I actually have a, oh well. Uh, if, if we were to find a star like that, it would have no absorption features inside of its spectrum except for that from hydrogen and helium. And actually, that was why people started searching for this in the first place, is they were hoping to find that, and they have not. So none so far, definitely not. Question? There's one here. Uh, will we, uh, assuming we keep developing better instruments, uh, will we be able to eventually see uh, the first stars, or are they too far away? Yes. Um, so probably not the next. So this generation, in the next sort of five to 10 years, we won't be able to. The generation after that depends on how much money people give to astronomers. <laughs> um, <laughs> Assume you have the perfect instrument. The question is, are they too far away and the light hasn't gotten? Um, no, it is possible to see them. And actually, they don't even have to. Um, yeah, we, we will. It is technically possible to see something that far away. As a matter of fact, we've seen things from before the first stars. The cosmic microwave background actually has reached us, and it's older than the first stars. That's, that's, a, that's a really great question that I bet Andrew knows a lot more about than I do. Uh, no, it's a really good question. I can take the microphone here. Um, and there really isn't a good answer um, from, from cosmology and, and astrophysics right now because we can't see back to that time to actually make observations. There are a lot of theories out there. So when we don't have observations, we like to come up with different theories about what might be going on and then try to test them. Some theories just say there was nothing before the Big Bang. That was not only the start of the universe, but the start of time itself. There are other theories that say there was a whole cycle of the universe before that. The universe expanded, collapsed, it expanded again, and it will keep doing so forever. The real answer is right now we just don't know. And it's a very difficult question to, to try and answer scientifically. But it's a fascinating question to ask. OK, well, thank you, everybody. Let's thank our speakers again.